Hey everybody, how's it going? Today, we are going to cover the first half of the process that I use for tuning my printers from start to finish. Yes, it's a long process, but in the end, I think it's well worth it to print high quality parts at high speeds. If you're looking for a specific technique, be sure to check the timestamps in the description below. With all that said and done, let's get started. Number one, extruder rotation distance. This is a very common process that I'm sure everyone has heard of before. We just want to make sure that our extruder is pushing exactly as much filament as the firmware thinks it's pushing. To do this, we simply load filament into the extruder, measure 120 millimeters from the top of the extruder, and mark the filament there. Once you have it marked, tell the printer to very, very slowly extrude 100 millimeters and then measure the remaining filament. In a perfect world, there should be exactly 20 millimeters of filament remaining, but realistically, it will probably be off by a millimeter or two if you haven't tuned yet. Make sure that max extrude only distance is set to something greater than 100. If you don't change this setting, you will just get an error when trying to extrude for the test. You'll want to do your extrusion very slowly at one millimeter per second or 60 millimeters per minute as Clipper handles it, just to make sure that there's no flow rate bottlenecks impacting the amount of filament extruded. In my case, my result looked just about perfect, and this makes sense since I've tuned this setting before. If you're doing this for the first time, you will likely be off by a millimeter or two. You can calculate your new rotation distance with the following formula. Your new rotation distance is equal to the previous one times the amount you actually extruded divided by 100. So for example, if your old rotation distance was 22.452 and you extruded 98 millimeters instead of 100 millimeters, your new rotation distance would be equal to 22.002 or 98% of what it was previously. If you want to be extra precise, you could perform this test multiple times and slowly dial in a more exact value for your rotation distance. You don't need to go too crazy with it though, two or maybe three iterations should be plenty. Now that we are confident our extrusion is dialed in, we can move on to some other tests. In order to get the most performance out of your printer, it's crucial that your belts are tensioned to the proper spec. Of course, what actual tension is proper is dependent on the printer that you are tuning. My bigger 300mm Trident, for instance, is running the stock Voron gantry. As a result, I am limited to around 2.5 pounds of belt tension before I risk bending the stepper motor shafts. On the other hand, my 250 Trident has double shear support on the motor shafts to stop them from bending, so the max tension I can run with 6mm GT2 belts is around 8 pounds. Here are the recommended tension values for common belt setups, given in pounds of force. I prefer dealing with tension in terms of pounds of force rather than the Voron method of hertz per 150mm, but it's pretty easy to convert between the two with some basic math. For your convenience, here is the spec tension of some common belt types you may be working with in hertz as well. There is a really great online calculator that makes finding these values easy, and I'll have a link to it in the description so you can play around with it. Of course, these values only apply if you have proper double shear support. If you don't, you'll want to stick with around 2.5 pounds of tension as a safe limit for your machine. Don't worry too much about the exact tension of your belts. On a Core XY, it is much, much more important that the two belts are evenly tensioned. It should be pretty easy to hear the different frequencies when the two belts aren't evenly tensioned. Now that your belts are nice and tight, and also, more importantly, evenly tensioned, we can move on to the next step. Input shaping is truly the key for fast, quality printing. By mounting an accelerometer to your tool head and running a quick calibration routine, you're able to cancel out unwanted vibrations and print at higher speeds without ringing. Input shaping is an incredibly in-depth topic that you can easily spend days and days tuning to perfection, but I'll try to keep it simple for today's video. First and foremost, you are going to need some kind of accelerometer. Popular options include the LDO Input Shaper Kit, Provoc 3D's Nozzle ADXL, and the Fizek Portable Input Shaper, which is what I'll be using today. Each of these boards need to have firmware flashed to them and need to be configured as a secondary MCU in your printer.cfg file. While this may initially sound daunting, most of these boards have thorough, step-by-step -step documentation that makes this process a breeze. Once your board is ready to go, you'll need to plug it into your clipper host of choice and attach it to your tool head. Something to note, for optimal results, you will want to mount your accelerometer to your printer's nozzle, not just anywhere on the tool head. 
there are plenty of printed mounts online that will get the job done. Taking your measurements from anywhere other than the nozzle doesn't make sense, because ultimately it's the vibrations of the nozzle that are actually going to show up in our prints. A lot of CAN boards boast integrated accelerometers as well nowadays, but for the aforementioned reason, these are not ideal and should be avoided. With everything set up and ready to go, input shaping is as simple as just entering a command into the clipper console and letting the printer shake itself around for a while. You will need to do this test twice, once for the x-axis and once for the y-axis. If your printer is a bed slinger, you will need to mount the ADXL to your bed in order to run the test on Y. On Stock Clipper, the way to generate and access the graphs is as follows. First, you'll want to SSH into your Clipper host, and once connected, you'll run the following command. This command will generate a graph based on the data that your accelerometer just recorded. Once the graph has been created, it will be saved to a folder called TMP, and you can use a program like WinSCP to access them. Once you have your graph, there will be a few things to look out for. First and foremost, an ideal graph will have one very tall and well-defined peak, with the rest of the graph being relatively flat. The graphs on screen here are from Cloaked Wayne, the creator of the monolith gantry, and these are basically the best graphs a person could hope for. In contrast, here are the X and Y graphs for my trident. You'll want to pay attention to the power spectral density, this value here, which for me is 1E5, or 10 to the power of 5. If your graph looks more like a mountain range than one small peak, and you have a very low value for this number, like 1E2 or 1E3, you might need to shake the printer harder by increasing the Excel per hertz value in the config, and then running the test again. I would recommend playing around and experimenting with different Excel per hertz values until you find the value that gives you the best results. In my case, I ended up going with 175 on my 250 Trident, and 150 on the 300. Don't just copy those values, you'll need to experiment for your own setup. You also will want to make sure to delete the old .csv files before creating new graphs, otherwise your graphs will contain both sets of data and not be accurate. If you want to learn more about reading and interpreting input shaper graphs, I've linked a few other videos down below that will explain in greater detail than I will here. In the end, after running many, many different tests, these were my final results for the 300mm build. We can now input the shaper type and the frequency that we want to target in our printer.cfg file, and now we're ready to go. You will want to rerun Input Shaper anytime that something on your motion system changes. For instance, swapping tool heads, using a new extruder, or even more minor changes like retensioning your belts or increasing your motor current. All of these will have an impact on your IS performance, albeit some more than others. In order to figure out how fast we can print, we need to find the maximum flow of our printer's hot end. Thankfully, this process is quick and easy to do. In fact, there's a dedicated button for it in Orca Slicer. As you can see here, as the part gets taller, it requires more and more flow to be printed properly. All we need to do is print this file and record at what height the filament starts under extruding. Different hot ends have different expected values for max flow, but these can shift wildly depending on the hot end temperature, the type of filament you're printing, and whether or not you're using nozzles with flow enhancing geometry like CHTs. Once the test is over, we simply measure the height where it started under extruding, and match that to the requested flow rate at that height in the slicer. In my case, it looks like the 300mm started under extruding at around 25 cubic millimeters per second, with PLA at 235C. Honestly, that value is far lower than it should be on my particular setup, and it makes me wonder if my hot end is over-reporting the printing temperature. I have noticed some strange temperature readings on this machine lately, it's possible the thermistor is just on its way out. Potential issues aside, since we now know the fastest I can currently extrude is 25 cubic millimeters per second, we will set that as the maximum volumetric speed for my printer profile. I don't intend for these values to be extremely precise, but rather just to keep me in the right ballpark when determining my maximum speeds. Different brands of filament will have slightly different properties, so if you want to be extra precise, you can run this test for every single brand you own. I opt to just round the values down a bit, and then use them for all of my profiles for a given type of filament. So rather than having a separate value for Polymaker PLA, and Sparta PLA, and Spool 3D PLA, I just have one general PLA value, which is close enough for all of them. For 99% of people, you are going to be limited by your hot end flow rate rather than your motion system. Still, it's not a bad idea to find the limits of your machine's movement speeds as well. To do this easily, I use Andrew Ellis's macro. Just copy it from his GitHub and paste it into your printer.cfg. The goal here is just to find the true maximum speeds and accelerations your printer is capable of. 
The test is very simple. Just keep increasing the printer speeds and accelerations until the motors skip. All right, this is gonna be 300 millimeters per second at 10,000 accelerations. This should be easy peasy. I already printed these speeds. Three hundred looks slow. I should have mentioned this before, but once you're getting up to the point where there's a chance it could skip, you might want to have your finger on the emergency stop. The number of iterations you run is up to you. Once you've settled on a value that is roughly the maximum, it's helpful to do a longer test with 50 to 100 iterations, just to make sure that your machine can handle these speeds for longer periods of time. The only real use case for finding these limits is just to set your travel moves to be extra fast. In my case, I've decided to run 500 millimeters per second at 20k XL on both Tridents, because I'm confident they can handle it. I'm using Moon's motors running on 24 volts and only one amp, so I have loads of overhead if I decide to just increase the motor current. If you have the power and want to run travels at 2000 millimeters a second, then by all means, please do so. That marks the end of our printer specific tests and also the end of today's video. In the second part, everything will be filament specific. As always, thank you so much for watching, have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you guys in two weeks.